and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Even today, once again on the 9th of uh, February 2022, in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, we are gathered here together via the technical equipment Skype on the internet to do another study of Exploding the Israel Deception, the book Steve Wolberg wrote in the beginning of the century and that we have used as a basis for our study all along. And uh, since last time I told you um, that in another study that Tom and I do with uh, Robert each Tuesday, I came up with, you know, there's this list uh, that I saw in a video years and years ago about what the different reformers thought of the two beasts, what the different reformers thought of the uh, two beasts of Revelation 13, the sea beast and the land beast as it is called um, that there was a table where that was shown that was so intriguing and interesting but I couldn't remember the video and then last week I told you that by the grace of God I found it by watching another video and of course I uh, then went to the website where that is taken from I took a, a little movie without any sound just filming the website scrolling down and Tom and I will go into that today by showing to you what the reformers starting in the, I think, 13th or 14th century, you will see when the video starts, uh, what they thought of who is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist and also uh, what they thought of what is Beast 1 and what is Beast 2 of Revelation 13. But even though that is a minor information that is not so um, very well brought forth in that study there and it is only a uh, selected few reformers so there are probably many many more and um, probably many many more of who we don't know anything about what they think about uh, or who they understood Revelation 13 but <clears throat> one thing I can also already tell you and I can do a little spoiler with that none of that in the list thought that the second beast of Revelation 13 is the United States of America. That I'm going to spoil to you and then we go into the facts but not before we have welcomed our guest and co-host Tom Fress from Inquisition Update today. Hello Tom. Hello Jörg, it's a pleasure, blessing and privilege to be here and uh, you and with you and uh, the listeners and uh, I would only begin by making the statement that uh, <clears throat> these names of uh, the people that throughout history uh, gave their understanding about who the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 is <clears throat> and who the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 is uh, almost unanimously believed that the second beast was the papacy. Just as I believe and just as you believe and just as the Protestant reformers believed. And uh, these are the saints throughout history who held this belief that the old Roman Empire, the first beast, was simply replaced by the new Roman Empire, the papacy. The first beast was the old Roman Empire under the Caesars, a pagan regime, and uh, the, 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 the pagan Roman Empire was really withholding the rise of the second Roman Empire. And when it was taken out of the way, by divine providence taken out of the way, that man of sin was revealed, the papacy. And uh, the old Roman Empire, or the pagan Roman Empire, became the so-called the, the so -called Holy Roman Empire, <laughs> which is the absolute opposite of what it really is. It's the man of sin. It's the son of perdition. It is the global government under the Pope. It's called the Holy Roman, uh, the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, he, he was instantly recognized by the saints as being the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one that Daniel prophesied about the one that Paul prophesied that was to come, and the one that John prophesied. It was the Roman papacy. And this knowledge 
is what caused the saints of old to be burned at the stake, to be killed. This is the very thing that caused the martyrdom of the saints all throughout history. It's this understanding that the old Roman Empire, the beast number one, just simply morphed into the second beast, which is still Roman, the papacy. And uh, the, the Antichrist is Roman. Okay? It's the papacy. It's the, the, the self-styled king of kings and lord of lords. Whereas the pagan Roman Empire sought to rule the whole world uh, under just out of brute force, the Holy Roman Empire wants to rule the world, both the physical world and the spiritual world. That's what makes it unique in all the world. It's, it's a, a religio-political system headed up by Babylon the Great, okay? And uh, the papacy styles itself Caesar. The papacy styles itself uh, the Roman emperor. And uh, this is knowledge that is not taught in the churches, but is very real, and we're going to prove it's real, and historically believed and studied and taught and eventually became the cause of all the martyrdoms throughout Christian history. If you believed what these people believe, then you were the target for martyrdom. Okay? The, the martyred saints throughout history are made up of those who believed that the first beast was the old Roman Empire and the second beast of Revelation 13 was the Holy Roman Empire under the under the the papal Caesars? Okay, with that set up, I hand it back to Yerk. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I hope uh, the picture was clear uh, for everyone to see what this means when actually uh, the Pope Antichrist Pius the Ninth, in this regard, uh, gives us uh, the clear understanding of a state church union that is what roman catholicism feeds on that the church rules the temporal powers and if you have any questions about that just go to tom's reading of the global vatican and you will have no doubt of that anymore and here pope pius IX even said it that the caesar who now addresses you and whom alone are obedience and fidelity due so the pope the head of the Roman Catholic Church, the Bishop of Bishops, self-pronounced of course, calls himself Caesar. What is that but church and state in one? Hmm? Good. And the papacy is the Antichrist. We're probably going to need that picture once more. Okay, we are going to do this little movie. I'm going to play it. I'm going to pause it. And we're going to read the text too, because um, that is, um, I think, of importance. And of course, uh, Tom's mic is on, and whenever he wants to say something, he can say something, because the video is without any volume. Yeah, I just took the liberty uh, to go to a website, and the link will be provided in the description box of this video. Um, and that website just provides these facts. We are in no way affiliated to that website. Yeah? We don't even know where he got all that information from on that website, and we don't care, but we know the information is valid and truth, and that's what it's all about. Now, we start here with Arnulf, Bishop of Orléans, who is a Roman Catholic, who says in a quote that is uh, printed by Philip Schaff, deplored the Roman popes as monsters of guilt and declared in a council called by the King of France in 991 AD that the pontiff, clad in purple and gold, was, quote, Antichrist, sitting in the temple of God and showing himself as God, which is a quote from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul warned about this. Correct, Tom? Yes, that's correct. And Philip Schaff is a church historian, so he, he's uh, he's uh, recounting history, real history. Eberhard II, who was Archbishop of Salzburg, Salzburg is in Austria. That is the Habsburg uh, ruling uh, 
Catholic ruling power during the Middle Ages also, he said, stated at the Synod of Bishops held at Regensburg in 1240, some scholars say 1241, that the people of his day were accustomed to calling the Pope Antichrist. This is taken from the Prophetic Faith of Our Father in four volumes review published uh, by uh, Review and Herald Publishing Associates, printed in uh, 1950 to 1954. John Wycliffe, also called the Morning Star of the Reformation, who lived in the 14th century, said, when the Western Church was divided about 40 years between the two rival popes, one in Rome and one other in Avignon, France, each pope called the other pope Antichrist, and John Wycliffe is reputed to have regarded them as both being right. Quote, two halves of Antichrist making up the perfect man of sin between them. Unquote. Now look at this. Take note. This is John Wycliffe. Wycliffe, as some pronounce it, uh, called the morning star of the Protestant Reformation in England. And he recites quotes that were widely known. And, and, and the papacy calls itself the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. And yet, here we have in history, recorded by John Wycliffe and others, that there were two popes fighting over the chair of Peter, fighting over the throne, um, and one stationed in Rome at the Vatican and the other stationed in a, in a makeshift Vatican in Avignon, France, both claiming the papacy. It's like two Jesuses in the world fighting over, fighting over the title, Vicar of Christ, and calling one another the Antichrist. Okay? This is, this is, we're not making this up. This is real history. And of course, at one time, and I've, re I've cited it many, many times, there were, in this case, three professing popes at the same time. Not just two, three professing papacies, uh, popes, all claiming to be the vicar of Christ, the, son, the replacement of the Son of God. And they all called each other the Antichrist. Now, who do you think is correct? Do you think we're just making this up? Listen, it was so widely known and professed among Bible-believing Christians that the papacy was the Antichrist, that the papacy, using the kings of the earth over which he ruled, sought these people out and killed them to shut them up. That's what happens when you when you openly state the known fact, the biblical, historical, and prophetic fact. They can't refute it. There's too much evidence to support it. So they have to kill you, okay? You ever heard of the man that knows too much? That's what every Bible-believing Christian is to the papacy, the man who knows too much. And while they're killing everybody that believes that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, they're busy with their Jesuits going around to all the Protestant churches, teaching them to be futurists, that the 70th week of Daniel is future, and that the Antichrist won't be revealed until that future comes, which automatically exonerates all the popes of history, doesn't it? Now do you see how you've been deceived in the churches? You don't even know who the martyrs of Jesus are or why they were martyred. Now we're telling you. We're telling you what your priesters and pastors should have been telling you all along. The martyrs of Jesus are those who knew in their heart that the papacy is the Antichrist, that Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. And it's their blood that now soaks the earth. And it is their blood that still cries from the ground for justice, for vengeance, for recompense. But the Bible says of our generation, he says the saints perish and no one takes it to heart. Do you feel convicted by that? I do. 
because for most of my Christ, professed Christian life, I never mourned the martyrs. I didn't know anything about the martyrs, much less what they believed and what caused their martyrdom. Their martyrdom was caused by knowing and believing and stating that Jesus is the Christ and the papacy is the Antichrist. That's why they died. That's the mark of the saints, those who know who the Christ is and those who know who the Antichrist is. That's whose blood cries to God from the dust of the ground, even to this day. Now do you see how slothful and wicked your churches are for not telling you this? You, you don't just think that I've got a bad attitude about the churches. I've got reason to be angry. Okay? We're not to be angry falsely. To falsely accuse is sin. This is no false accusation. The churches are guilty of holding these vital truths from us. And it's time to know the truth. And I'm blessed and privileged to be a part of the dissemination of that truth. And you can thank Yerk, too, for putting it on the air. Back to you, Yerk. So the next quote we read here is from Martin Luther, who, of course, was a Lutheran because the Lutheran church was named after him. We here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. Personally, I, Martin Luther, declare that I owe the Pope no other obedience than that to Antichrist. That was written or stated August 18, 1520. Also taken from the Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, page 121. In response to a papal bull, uh, which was called Exerge Domine, uh, that was his um, excommunication, uh, excommunication bull, I think, he says, I despise and attack it as impious, false. It is Christ himself who is condemned therein. I rejoice in having to bear such ills for the best of causes. Already I feel greater liberty in my heart, for at last I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his throne is that of Satan himself. Quoted in Dobinius' masterwork on the Protestant Reformation. Cut hey, that was quoted from Merle Dobigny, uh, 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 a historian of the Protestant Reformation. I have his works here on on the on the shelf in my library. The History of Protestantism by Merle de Bigny. It's a voluminous work. Yes, it's a voluminous work. That's right. It's huge. And uh, there was no mistake in Dobigny's belief. There was no mistake in Martin Luther's belief. And of course, your your priesters and your pastors aren't going to tell you this because they want you to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. They want unity without unity it's all a pretense it's a show it, it it's a lie is what it is it's just deceiving the whole world you have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness why in the world would you ever unite with the synagogue of satan the papacy why would you ever have anything to do with the roman catholic church when it's guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of jesus back to you york Thank you, Tom. I always value your comments. But we continue with Cuthel Mather, who was a congressional theologian, who says, quote, The oracles of God foretold the rising of an Antichrist in the Christian Church. And in the Pope of Rome, all the characteristics of that Antichrist are so marvelously answered that if any who had read the scriptures do not see it, there is a marvelous blindness upon them. Unquote taken from The Fall of Babylon by Cotton Mathers and Froome's book, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, once again. Yep. Froome now, was also a church historian, yep. and he wrote about this, and and uh, uh, he's absolutely certain. He's, he's re reaffirming all that we're going to see in this is that all true Bible-believing Christians believe that the papacy is the Antichrist. This isn't just a new—this isn't something new. This is the ancient belief of Bible-believing Christians. 
and, and you should know about it. Your pastors should have told you about it, but they haven't. And now that's an indictment that you cannot ignore any longer, okay? They, they've withheld from you absolutely vital information. Now, now, the only way in this world today to discover who the Antichrist is is by reading the scriptures, okay? That's the infallible word of God. It positively identifies the Antichrist so that no one can make a mistake. But it's prophetic in nature. In other words, you have to be able to compare the words of Scripture that identify this papal Antichrist. You have to be able to compare it with the history of the Roman pontiff, the Roman Catholic popes throughout history. And guess what? They hide that papal history from you so that you cannot compare. But the business of Inquisition Update has been for 20 years, and also the business of, of, of your Glissman, uh, Joggler 66, is to make that papal history available to you so that you can compare the, the, the passages in the Scripture that colorfully, infallibly describe the Antichrist of history, Scripture, and prophecy, and you can compare it with the history of the papacy. The visibility of the papacy is global. Anybody who pays any attention can compare what is evident on its face with the scriptures. And so they just don't tell you anything about the papacy. They don't tell you anything about Roman Catholic canon law. They don't tell you anything about papal bulls. They don't tell you anything about the Jesuits. They don't tell you anything about the Counter-Reformation. They don't tell you anything about the Council of Trent. They don't tell you anything about the Inquisitions. They hide from you all the information that would lead you to believe the truth that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, the persecutor of the saints. And that's why no one today takes the martyrdom of uh, the martyrs of Jesus, their loss to heart. Nobody even considers it. Why? Because nobody ever talks about the Inquisition. It's your pastor's responsibility. And if he doesn't tell you about the Inquisition, if he doesn't tell you why they were martyred, he's not fit for the office that he holds in your church. That is a fact. He's not qualified. He's a blind leader of the blind, and that's to say the best you can say about him. Back to you, York. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I just wanted to go back to this one sentence that he said here. All the characteristics of that Antichrist are so marvelously answered that if any who read the scriptures do not see it, there is a marvelous blindness upon them. The point is, all the characteristics of that Antichrist. Well, you saw me in the meantime while Tom was making a comment, looking up a playlist that I have on uh, YouTube that is called characteristics of antichrist you know <laughs> he gives me the stop word characteristics of that antichrist i said oh no i have videos on that and i talked to that about uh, with tom even before we went uh, on this broadcast today we did these uh, readings of characteristics of antichrist somewhere i think in 2015 if i'm not mistaken let's just have a look uh, this video the first one was uploaded on the 28th of february so today we have the 9th of february just seven years later uh, you see these videos are still online it only has been viewed 3,000 something times people don't care for the truth they didn't care then they don't care now we know that okay we don't discuss that uh, the ones who are led by the Holy Spirit will find these info this information anyway uh, but we did as you can see 11 videos uh, sometimes more than two hours yeah, two hours four minutes 50 minutes 12 minutes 223 209 250 yeah so 26 times uh, sorry 11 times that we discussed uh, 26 characteristics of antichrist um, that in the time we took from uh, uh, the same website 
where uh, this information that you see in this video here is, is taken from, yeah? remnantofgod.org. Um, and we uh, thought that we fully understood the deception of the Antichrist then. Uh, no, we did not, because we were also falling into a trap of the 1260 year deception, but that is for a completely different broadcast, not for today. But the ground stone, uh, the, 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 uh, the cornerstone, for, uh, let's call it, for that is laid today. And that is al was already laid here. 26 characteristics with what, without any doubt, you can identify the papacy as the Antichrist in that study. And of course, here, Cotton Mather gives me uh, the stop word when he says all the characteristics of that Antichrist. So I just had to tell you of that information and that um, uh, playlist can be found on my main channel on YouTube, of course, so you can look that up there. Yeah, sorry, Tom, I had to make a little advertisement for, <laughs> for these old videos that maybe someone is uh, going to have a look at them because they, they are wonderfully and... Uh, just just want to add that what Yerk is just now telling you is that he has available on his website videos that show you all the information that your pastors are not telling you about. And, and and after you review all that information, you have to ask yourself the un, the undeniable question: Why is not my pastor telling me these things? What is the motive to keep this vital information secret? Why is it not talked about in the churches? You have to ask yourself that question. Anyway, let's go on to John Wesley. Is another marvel mystery to me. Speaking of the papacy, John Wesley said, "Quote." He is, in an emphatical sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure. And he is, too, properly styled the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers. He it is, that exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, claiming the highest power and highest honour claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone, unquote. Taken from Antichrist and his Ten Kingdoms by John Wesley. And now you have the leader of the Wesleyan Church, the leader of the what is now known as the Methodist Church, which has now become totally ecumenical, wants to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, and believes you're a heretic if you prevent this union that they so desire. I would not be welcome in a Wesleyan church. You would, I would not, not be, be welcome, welcome in a Lutheran church either, so because I, we called it no. Martin Luther before, who was the name of the right. Lutheran church. I yeah. wouldn't be welcome in any church. I would not be welcome in any church. And that's why I don't seek fellowship in an established church. They are all gone astray. And uh, we've proven that over and over and over again. As unlikely as it would be, the Martin Luther Church has now become wholly ecumenical. And uh, it's a horror beyond belief what is happening in the church. You know, people think I'm just being melodramatic when, when I say get out of the churches. That, that I'm just trying to, you know, uh, glamorize myself or bring emphasis to myself when I say something so radical as get out of the church. This isn't radical. This is common sense. Any church that wants to reunite with the synagogue of Satan, any church that wants you to become a subject of the Holy Roman Pontiff is a church of Satan. And they all want you to do this. Tom, when you say get out of the churches, you're just quoting scripture, Revelation 18, verse okay. 4. Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins, so that you receive not also of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. He's not forgotten her iniquities. He hasn't forgiven her iniquities. He has remembered her iniquities. And she is going to be destroyed without hand by the brightness of his coming and by the spirit of his mouth. And if you are one of the so-called Protestant and evangelical churches that have reunited with this whorish Romish mother, 
you're going to suffer the same judgment. The churches are a death trap. No, that's not melodrama. That's not Tom trying to shock people into his own self-popularity. This is a fact. Okay? You follow the churches right down the primrose path to perdition because that's all where they're heading. The only safe place for a Bible-believing Christian is outside the churches. And I've made the point so perfectly so many times as to be inarguable. The churches are spiritual death traps for God's people. They are just as apostate as the, the religious leaders of the day when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. And what did he say of them all? A generation of vipers. That's what he called them. Blind guides. That's what he called them. Sons of perdition. That's what they all were. The synagogue of Satan. And the same thing is said of the churches today. And it's no melodrama. It's the fact. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. The next word comes from Ellen G. White, one of the founding leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, when she says, quote, This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. The compromise between paganism and Christianity. That is what happened in 321 when Constantine made quote-unquote Christianity that was already fallen away at that time, but that's another matter, the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire in 321. That's a compromise, and therefore it is very much of importance that you understand that the Bible doesn't make compromises. There was a compromise because the state felt that it could not deal with this new upcoming religion, with this new upcoming belief, because when they killed a hundred thousand stood up, and when they killed a thousand, ten thousand stood up, and so on. They just couldn't get the word of God out of the world. So what do you do when you cannot defeat your enemy? You infiltrate him. You destroy yeah. him from, from within. It's Therefore, a Roman dictum that if you can't defeat him, join him. Join them. Exactly. That's right. That's what the, that's what the, 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 the Roman Caesar did. He couldn't defeat the word of God. He couldn't defeat Jesus and his followers. So he just included them in his own. And uh, that's how the paganization of the church, the true church of Jesus Christ, took place. Now, now we just quoted from Ellen G. White, and I know a lot of eyebrows are going up. Oh, they must be Seventh-day Adventists. Look, we take the truth wherever it is found. When and we she give says credit the truth, she says the, she says the truth, huh? she, That's right. When she says the truth, we acknowledge her. You know, we don't believe Ellen G. White was a prophet. We don't believe the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the church outside of which there is no salvation. So you can't classify us as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But we give credit where credit is due. Ellen G. White knew who the Antichrist was. She also knew who Jesus Christ was. I just wish she hadn't, you know, reckoned herself a prophetess and, and, and made some uh, terrible eschatological errors that are still believed and followed by by uh, Seventh-day Adventists around the world. But uh, we give credit where credit is due. And uh, it's, uh, you know, people are going to look with, with the sconce, with the suspicion, uh, anytime you quote something from Ellen G. White or any Seventh-day Adventist. But I'm telling you what, they had more correct than they had wrong. And uh, I acknowledge that. All right, back to you, Yerk. Oh, and, and, and I speak for myself. I don't speak for Yerk. I allow Yerk to speak for himself when it comes to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I know one thing. That church has been infiltrated by the Jesuit just like every other church on the planet. There's no safe Seventh-day Adventist Church. There's no more uh, uh, safety in in, in the Seventh-day Adventist church than there is in a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Lutheran church, an Episcopalian church, or any other denomination of churches. 
the Jesuits have infiltrated them all. They've led them all astray. They've confused and confounded the truth to where we all are in a disagreement in some form or fashion with the others. That's why we have no unity in the body of Christ. The spoiler has come in and corrupted us all. And it's time for us all to take consideration of the scripture and to take consideration of history and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that is true ecumenism. But I'll tell you what, the bottom line for any successful means of uniting the body of Christ into one doctrine, one Lord, one king, one kingdom, one constitution, and that is the knowledge that Jesus is the Christ the papacy is the Antichrist. Start there, and God will give you a chance, and he'll help you. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, the point that I wanted to make with this quote from Ellen G. White when, he, when she says, the compromise between paganism and Christianity is the starting of the uh, church and state union that was begun in 321 A.D., when the emperor uh, took the bishop of Rome and more or less uh, melted together with him. And why do I say that he melted together with him? Well, because I just showed you what... Uh, where's the picture now again? <laughs> I put it away. I just showed you what Antichrist uh, Pope Pius IX said. All hail Caesar, the Caesar who now addresses you and in whom alone obedience and fidelity do. Here you have the modern Caesar Constantine in the Pope of Rome. Once Out again, of the Pope's own mouth. You can't argue with that. Yeah, That's a he, quote from Pope Pius IX. In his Discorsi on page 253, volume 1. You can read that if you want to. You will find it there. So the point is... The Roman Catholic Church not only uh, admits that she is a melting of church and state, she boasts on that. Because that's what the Antichrist does here. He boasts on that, what Jesus Christ forbids. And when we speak about um, the churches, and Tom says so righteously that there is none not one church that you can find on this earth that is not infiltrated by Jesuits, that is not infiltrated with wrong teaching. That is why Jesus Christ said, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, in their midst I will be. Now, two or three people is a very small congregation, I give you that. But Jesus had a church that was bigger than, tw uh, than three people, he had twelve disciples. And even in that quote-unquote church, evil entered in, in the form of Judas Iscariot. That's right. Okay? So, when even that church was infiltrated by a bad spirit, when even the ark was entered by a bad spirit, when um, Noah and his family was on there, because the spirit is not to be drowned with water. The spirit survives, and that spirit survived the ark. Well, the Roman Catholic Church, <laughs> my dear brethren, calls itself the Ark of Noah. Well, on the Ark of Noah was the spirit of Antichrist present, because it survived the flood. Nothing else survived the flood, so the spirit must have been on that ark. So when the Roman Catholic Church says she is the, like the Ark of Noah, then also she has that spirit of Antichrist by her own words. And you can look that up. That is in the Catechism. That is in the universal Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church that the Roman Catholic Church declares, pronounces, and says that she is the Ark like Noah's Ark. Well, when there was the deception on, then surely the deception is in the Roman Catholic Church. Tom, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's outrageous that anybody would, uh, would believe it, but then the world is 25% Roman Catholic. <laughs> At least. <laughs> There's 25% of the living, breathing souls in this world believe that the papacy truly is the replacement of the Son of God on earth. 
that he is both Caesar, the lawgiver, and Christ, or the vicar of Christ. 25% of the world's population are Roman Catholic, at very least 25%. And uh, the influence that they have on our society and our laws and our schools and the degradation of morals in this world is visibly evident if you will just look. And it's your pastor's responsibility to show you this. And if he's not showing you, there's another indictment of your, papers, of, of your papally controlled pastors. Hideous reality, isn't it? You begin, if you listen very long, you begin to wonder how all of this took place right under your nose and you didn't recognize it. That's how subtle the serpent is. Back to you, Yerk. The point that we really have to put out here is that when she says the compromise between paganism and Christianity means that there is a compromise that Christianity is willing to do. Well, true Christianity, and I think that Tom will have a comment on what I say right now also, true Christianity is built on the rock, Jesus Christ and his word, the Bible. We, Tom and me, as we do these broadcasts, are advocates for the 1611 authorized version of the King James Bible. We think that this is the most original preserved word of God that we can look on today, that we can study today in the 21st century, the most uncorrupt word that does not say that it is absolutely infallible. The original texts maybe are, but the King James is a translation. And you always have to be careful with translations. On the other hand, I don't speak Hebrew. Tom doesn't speak Hebrew. I don't speak Greek. Tom doesn't speak Greek. So we rely on the translation of, in this case, the 1611 King James Bible. But the Bible does not make any compromise. So when Ellen G. White says the compromise between paganism and Christianity, we have to understand that Christianity here cited is not what we should understand of real Christianity that follows the Bible and the Bible does not make any compromises. There already is a mistake and because that Christianity in the beginning of the 4th century when the decree came by Emperor Constantine, that church was already infiltrated. As Paul said in Thessalonians, the mystery of iniquity doth already work and he is speaking of the year 60 AD. 300 something is five times far from that moment. They were already infiltrated. And when you follow Tom's and my videos for a time, you know that we have been making um, videos on Simon Magus, Acts chapter 8, to be the founder of the Roman Catholic Church. I did videos with that with, I think, Brett and the Time and, and, and my German friend Michael, um, showing you uh, by the book of... Um, What's that name again? Simon versus Simon uh, Magus versus Simon uh, Simon Peter. Um, Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer. Yeah. What, what what what's the author of that book again, Tom? You read that also on First Amendment uh, Radio. Um, oh, His name escapes me for the moment. Yeah, it's on the tip of my tongue. That. It's on the tip yeah. of my tongue. But we we did uh, I think thirty some videos on that to show. Ernest L. Martin. Oh, Ernest L. Martin. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, Ernest L. Martin. Um, and and uh, I have that on the papacy is the Antichrist, my English-only channel. I have that playlist completely uploaded, uh, where we do a study of how the church already was infiltrated from in the beginning. Because, you know, that that is one example that Tom always um, picks up. And I find that so wonderfully, uh, you know, of the deception, uh, or, or the, the, not the deception, but the the try, the, the, the um, uh, how do you say that? Um, 
how uh, Jesus was led into temptation or tried to let, lead into the, let, be led into temptation in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 when he was hungered after his baptism and he went into the desert for 40 days and didn't, uh, uh, didn't eat and didn't drink and the devil tempted him. And Jesus Christ three times answered him with the words of the Bible to which the devil doesn't have an answer. That's why he fled when he offered him all the kingdoms of the world. And what does Tom so famously say in many, many, many of his First Amendment Radio Inquisition Update broadcasts? He says, what do you think? The devil went into a corner and started weeping and said, ah, I didn't get my offer. No, he looked for another man to do the same offer to. The man Jesus Christ rejected it, but another man accepted the offer. And that's the one who we call today the Pope of Rome. But I think, Tom, you have in your own words a few additional comments to what I just said, right? Well, I want to add to, uh, I guess we were on uh, the quote from Ellen G. White, uh, but uh, she, she focuses on the paganization of the Christian church, uh, where paganism was united with the, 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 the so-called Christian church. Well, look, there's no unity between the true Christian church and paganism. Look, let's get back to basics. Anybody read their Bibles here? What always got the Israelites in hock with God? What did they do always and forever that el elicited the, the, the unreserved anger of Almighty God? They tried to ecumenically unite with the pagans all around them. They wanted to worship God in the tradition of the pagans. They wanted to have a king, just like the pagans. They wanted to have a temple, just like the pagans. They wanted to worship the rising sun, just like the pagans. They wanted to worship in the groves, just like the pagans. That's what happens when you mix paganism with Christianity, okay? So what happened with Constantine? It was the melding of Christianity with paganism, okay? That's a dead ringer. You can't get it wrong. God is never going to bless his church when it unites with the paganism. And this is what Ellen G. White refers to as the paganization of Christianity. That union became and still is the Roman Catholic Church. And the trouble with it is what really concerns you and me is the same pagan traditions that were absorbed within the Roman Catholic Church are also celebrated by the Protestant and Evangelical churches without exception. And if I were to go into detail about what those traditions are, we'd be here on the on the on the program all by ourselves. Please so do, Tom. Afraid. Please do. I, I'm not afraid of that. Please it's do. It's Sunday Sabbath, it's Easter, and it's Christmas. Those are the pagan traditions, and then some that the Roman Catholic Church invited into itself from the pagan world. And that much is all you need to know. God is never going to bless the Roman Catholic Church. It is what I've always said, the synagogue of Satan, and not just me, but quoted by all of the historical martyrs of Jesus all throughout history. That list about which we are now reading, all the names, Wesley, Lutheran, the, the Lutheran Church, all of these historical Protestant believers, these Bible-believing Christians all believe the same thing. The Roman Catholic Church was the great error, okay? And it deserves the undiluted wrath of Almighty God. There's no truth to be found in it. So you have to ask yourself, what in the world possesses your pastor to lead your congregation in joint efforts with the Roman Catholic Church? You simply must ask yourself that question. Back to you, Yerk. I add holiday, uh, I add uh, birthdays to the list that you just named there. 
because I'm not an advocate of birthdays. Uh, the few times birthdays are mentioned oh, yeah. in the Bible are by pagans. And uh, I did. It wasn't an exhaustive list. Jesus, no, I know, want, I know. <laughs> if you want me to recite all of the pagan traditions that are commonly observed in every church that calls itself a Christian church, you, you'd be bored to death. Yeah. <laughs> Look, there are no holy days in the churches. They don't observe any of the holy days. And those holy days are those that were declared in the Bible by God to be holy. And only God can declare a day holy because only he is holy. So if there's any day declared in this world to be a holy day or a holiday, and it's not found in the Bible and sanctified by God, it's a lie. It's a pagan tradition. And you better run from it like a scalded dog. Back to you, Yerk. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I love it when I get you heated up. Thomas Cranmer, who was an Anglican, said in uh, Works by Cranmer, Volume 1, pages 6 and 7, quote, Whereof it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist, and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers, and strong reasons. He is re here referring to prophecies in Revelation and Daniel. Roger Williams, who was the first Baptist pastor in the United States of America, says, He spoke of the Pope as, quote, the pretended vicar of Christ on earth, who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of all his vessels, yea, over the Spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yea, and God himself, speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition, as mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, from Froom, prophetic faith of our fathers. The 1689 London Baptist Confession, in chapter 26 of the Church, the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the Church, in whom, by the appointment of the Father, all power for the calling, institution, order or government of the church is invested in a supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalted himself and the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Unquote. John Knox a Scottish Presbyterian. Knox wrote to abolish, quote, that tyranny which the Pope himself has for so many ages exercised over the Church, and that the Pope should be recognized as, quote, the very Antichrist and son of perdition of whom Paul speaks, unquote, again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, taken from the Zurich Letters, page 199, by John Knox. John Calvin, who was a Presbyterian, they say here, says, quote, from the, the Institutes by John Calvin, some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman Pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against, uh, against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. That's absolutely right. And this is a key thing that's not taught in the churches. Paul literally described the papacy in his, in his uh, Thessalonians, letter to the Thessalonians. There was no way to get it wrong. Okay. No way to get it wrong. Paul told us who the Antichrist would be. Whoever was restraining the rise of this Antichrist must first be taken out of the way. And Paul, when he was among the Thessalonians, told them to their face in private, 
It is the Caesars of the of the Roman Empire. And when they are taken out of the way, that man of sin will be revealed. And that's exactly the way it happened in history. Why does not your pastor tell you this? The power that rose immediately after the Caesars were taken out of the way was the papacy. That is what was believed by all the founders of all the Protestant and evangelical churches. That's what we're reading. The, the quotes from the founders of the Protestant and evangelical churches, they all believe unanimously that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. That was the unity that they had in common with the belief that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus will always be the Christ. And the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition. Okay? Those are the two planks of true biblical Christianity. And people have known who the Antichrist was all the way back to the Thessalonian Christians under Paul's ministry. Okay? That's a fact. That's not an assumption. That's not an accusation. That is a historical fact. The Thessalonians knew who the Antichrist was, and they even prayed together in common in, in, in communion, praying for the longevity of the Caesars because they knew that power that replaced the Caesars would persecute the saints of the Most High, wear out the saints of the Most High, think to change times and laws. It would be the nemesis of Christ. And now we know it today, as did all Bible-believing Christians throughout history. It's the papacy. It was the papacy, it is the papacy, it always will be the papacy. Don't look for a future antichrist unless it's just the papacy. Every pope in succession from the very first to the last has fulfilled all the biblical, historical, and prophetic descriptions of the papacy throughout history. Anybody who's familiar with their Bible, anybody who's familiar with the, the history of the papacy, has no doubt in their mind. They are no more in doubt about who the Antichrist is than they are in doubt about who Jesus Christ is. Now ask yourself, why has not your pastor prepared you with this? Why have you been left in the dark? They want unity with Rome. They believe that the synagogue of Satan and the Antichrist himself are Christians. You have been deceived. You ever wonder why or how it was that Adam and Eve fell prey to the serpent? You've been just as equally deceived as Adam and Eve were. Hideous reality, isn't it? Back to you, Yerk. You made a very interesting point there, Tom, uh, when you... Uh, relied on the quotes from Henry Gretton Guinness's work, Romanism and the Reformation. I think that comes out of the work of Tertullian uh, when he mentions the prayers of the saints for the longevity of the Caesarian Rome. And I think it is quite appropriate since uh, we have come to an hour of our broadcast to take a little pause here and next time start with the reading of that wonderful prayer uh, of the Book of Romanism and the Reformation, which of course uh, we have available here. Um, and I also think it is interesting to make a break right here because we see what John Calvin, a Presbyterian, says. And then we are going to see next the Presbyterian Church in the year 2000. The following resolution was anonymously passed by the South Atlantic Presbyterity of the Bible Presbyterian Church meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, March 25th in the year 2000. And what they have to say in the 21st century, because uh, the time of uh, John Calvin, who was a Presbyterian, and the, uh, is a little uh, time ago. And then we will see what they say um, about that in the year 2000, the beginning of the 21st century. So I'm not going to show this all the time. We're going to look into that next time. 
Uh, you know, the video that I prepared is about 5 minutes and 13 seconds, and we did an hour for the first 16 seconds, so I guess you can have, you can do a little counting in the meantime until the next video comes out, and uh, count when we take 16 seconds for one hour, how many broadcasts do we need to get through that whole paper when it is 5 minutes and 13 minutes long? <laughs> No, it's, it's not that bad, because there are parts, of course, that will be dealt with a little bit longer. And it was not my intention to divert from the exploding the Israel deception study. I just think that this is a very worth addendum to the exploding the Israel deception study, especially since we are entering a part in that book that is called When the Wall Came Tumbling Down. And there is another subject that we really have to talk about that, um, that wall between the Jews and the Gentiles was torn down by Jesus Christ 2000 years ago, and the Roman Catholic Church built that wall up again. And one of the parts where they built that wall up again is, of course, denying that the papacy is the Antichrist, which is not only a Lutheran truth, a a Calvinist truth, a Presbyterian truth, a Seventh-day Adventist truth, if you will, um, because we mentioned Ellen G. White in this video, uh, and, and all the other, Cotton Mather and John Wycliffe, and uh, never forget anyone who we just quoted, it is the biblical truth, and the Roman Catholic Church has no other intention but to divert the attention from her as being the Antichrist, or the papacy being the Antichrist, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, diverting the attention to, from that point to any other Antichrist possible. And that is uh, a very important subject during the reading of Exploding the Israel Deception. I think Tom agrees with me here, and I hope to see you back next week. And I will leave the closing comments to Tom, and I'm very much looking forward to our next session. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I want to refrain with a advice I always give at the end of my videos. Please, read your Bibles. And here comes the end comment from Tom. Uh, I'll close with this. You know, the byword, the, the, the big mantra in all the churches today is unity at all costs. Unity at any cost. Why? Because there's division right now. And there has been division ever since the Protestant Reformation. But what we've just read, these quotes, can be described no other way than unity. They were all agreed. Jesus is the Christ. The papacy is the Antichrist. And they were right. They were correct. So what unity do they think they're going to get now by uniting with the Roman Catholic Church? God is not going to permit his saints to mix the holy with the profane. No more than he allowed the Jews to do it. So if you are in a church that thinks that there ought to be peace and unity with the man of sin in Rome, you have but one option. Get out. Get out now. I'll see you next week.
600 years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say by the same faith we live today.